He sailed to easy victories in previous elections, but not this time. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is facing his first serious political challenge in two decades. As Turkey heads for a runoff vote, can Erdogan keep his job? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. One of the most closely contested elections in Turkey's recent history has ended without a clear winner. Neither President Recep Tayyip Erdogan nor his main challenger, Kemal Kilic Darulu, were able to clinch a majority. Erdogan is perhaps the most important figure in Turkey since Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the founder of the Republic, a century ago. And Kilic Darulu, who is backed by a rare alliance of diverse political parties, has a real chance of unseating him. For the first time, the presidential election is going to a runoff. We were speaking to our guests about what all this means for Turkey's future. But first, here's Fintan Monahan with more on that first round result. <laughs> Turkey's future hangs in the balance. After the elections produced no clear winner, a second round of voting is set for later this month. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has told supporters he is ready for a runoff. The result is one of the opposition's best showings in years. Six parties united behind a single candidate, hoping to end Erdogan's two decades in power. Kemal Kilic Darolu says if he wins, he'll return Turkey to a parliamentary system. He's urged supporters to be patient. Despite his smear campaign against us, Erdogan hasn't gotten the result he wanted. If the first round wasn't enough to receive the mandate, we are going to get it in the runoff election. A third contender, Sinan Oğan, has done better than expected. So far, he's refusing to back either Erdogan or Kilic Darolu. There will be another difficult 15 days ahead of us, and during this time, if the elections are completed with the current results and go to the second round, we will do our best to make this process a good one for our nation and our country. At this time, we are not saying that we will support one party or the other. Erdogan's popularity has been dented in recent years. The economy is in crisis. High inflation and a plummeting local currency have left many families unable to afford basic food items. His government was accused of responding too slowly to two earthquakes in the southeast in February. 50,000 people died and more than 1.5 million are homeless. But supporters praise his record on trade and foreign investment, as well as ambitious infrastructure projects. Erdogan and Kilic Darolu have two weeks to convince voters that they're the best candidate to lead Turkey into a prosperous future. Vincent Monaghan, Al Jazeera. Well, for more on this, let's go to our guests now, all of them joining us from Istanbul. Tarek Koizulu, Professor of International Relations at Istanbul's Aydın University. Also, Helene Sara Artam, Associate Professor at Istanbul Medeniyet University. She specializes in Turkish foreign policy. And Yusuf Albarada is a columnist for Turkey Gazet Edsa, a retired Turkish colonel. Very warm welcome to all of you. Helene, let's go to you first. What surprises came out of this election for you? Well, for the first time, actually, we can call this a kind of victory, although you, or many of us are talking about a run, runoff, uh, a kind of balance in between the two leaders, and we are going to the second round. But at the same time, when I consider the huge amount of enthusiasm among the opposition party, opposition alliance, let's say, well, actually, we can still talk about a kind of victory on Erdogan's side. Uh, regarding the second run, uh, well, it's difficult. It will be a difficult and a very tense two weeks ahead of us, and we have to. We all have to be very careful in order not to increase the tension among Turkish society, mm. because we're, we are talking not not only about economy as. Bill Clinton called in the early 90s, he said, it's economy stupid, but actually this time I believe that it's not only economy uh, at stake. We, we can assume that there's a kind of lifestyle difference between both sides. 
there's a difference uh, regarding how to live in the next decades uh, for our children and for the, for the other parts of the Turkish nation. So I think we can call that this two weeks will be very difficult, very tense uh, in Turkey. Absolutely, because Turkey, Helene, is incredibly polarized right now. That's one thing this result has shown, isn't it? Well, this polarization is something global. We, we see the same uh, polarization, a huge amount of polarization in the United States as well. So the mm. people in almost every country all around the world, we are getting polarized. And actually, this is somehow related to the choice of being with democracy or without democracy. We are talking about democracy versus authoritarianism. Unfortunately, this might be the case in Turkey as well. For, for, for that reason, I think the people will be pushing so hard on the, uh, to have the right to decide for their future. Uh, unfortunately, yes, this is a kind of global wave, which is also affecting Turkey. Okay. Tarek, uh, let's bring you in at this point. I mean, Erdogan, is facing the biggest challenge of his 20-year career in power. However, he was expected to perform worse than he did. He did perform better than the polls predicted. Why was that? I think it was mainly because of the political campaigning uh, process Erdogan administration has been undertaken. Uh, the kind of messages they gave to the people are quite different from the kind of messages uh, given by uh, people alliance, uh, uh, nation alliance, I'm sorry. Erdogan very much underlined the importance of stability, and supporters of Erdogan might have come to the conclusion that should Erdogan lose these elections, maybe we will also get rid of our benefits we have been accruing so far. And these people, traditional supporters of Erdogan, are very much keen on the idea that territorial integrity and survival of the state might be at stake if Kılıçdaroğlu mm -hmm. comes to power. And Erdogan has been referring to the fact that Westerners, FETÖ, terror organization, all other constituencies which have a problem with Turkey, very much added the support for Mr. Oldu. So if you support me in this particular elections, you will give a lesson to those anti Turkish circles. That was the key message he was giving to his constituency. And he was also fond of talking about national grandeur. The people who supported Erdogan in the past seem to believe that Erdogan was the man who did many good things for the nation, for the people. So Erdogan is still the man who could figure mm. out solutions to our current problem. So could do again mentality played a very decisive role. And finally, maybe uh, Davutoğlu, Babacan and Karamoğlu, the kind of political figures who are considered to be political Islamists and have established previous relations with uh, Erdogan in the past, uh, were not accepted uh, by the traditional supporters of the Republican People Party who are extremely secular, who are extremely Atatürkist, who are extremely pro-Western in one way or another. And finally, there is a very much important psychological factor we have to take into account. What was the picture? One man, Erdogan, speaking against all eight men altogether. So mm. Turkish people like to see that uh, if you vary the support something against many other people, that you are our hero. This, our hero mentality, I think, played a significant role here. Interesting. OK, well, we'll come back to that uh, more about Erdogan's pulling appeal uh, shortly. First of all, Yusuf, we've heard why Erdogan perhaps did better than was expected. Why did his rival, Kamal Kilic Darulu, then perform worse? What was, where did, what was his fall down? Okay, uh, if you take a look at the Turkish voters' sociology, that is not a surprise for us who is uh, dealing with the Turkish politics for more than 30 years. When you take a look at the Turkish voters' sociology, 35% of the voters belong to the left parties. So when you take a look at to Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu's votes, it's 30 point, 35 point plus 10 point from good party, which is a right party mm. uh, in, uh, in actual. For that reason, that is not a surprise. When you add these two votes, 35 plus 10 from the good party, is again 45. So it was a huge manipulation that Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu will win 57, 58 percent of the Turkish voters was a huge manipulation which was done inside Turkey. The second issue, why Kılıçdaroğlu couldn't reach to 50 percent, Kılıçdaroğlu is not a new profile for Turkish politics. He came to the power 
in 2010. And in these 13 years, he lost 11th election to Erdogan. This mm -hmm. is not the first time. This is the 11th time that he is losing to Mr. Erdogan. So I do not understand why the Western media is so surprised why he has lost. He is the man lost every election he has participated because what he is telling to the Turkish people does not create any uh, excitement okay. in the... That's a, that's, a, that's a very interesting point that you brought up, though. I want uh, to pass it over to Helene. Uh, do you agree that Kilic Darula was never going to have an opportunity to win? I mean, he has, as Yusuf says, he's lost, or his party's lost uh, 10, now 11 times to Erdogan. Was he the wrong candidate? For the National Alliance to pick? Well, uh, the opposition could prefer a much stronger, a very charismatic name, but actually they couldn't find. That was the biggest problem. They couldn't mm. decide on one single very strong charismatic figure. Uh, and Kalishtarol was the only option in a way because uh, there wasn't any other. Uh, he was representing the, let's say, the uh, largest opposition group in Turkish parliament. But uh, I do agree with Yusuf that he did not perform well in the previous elections. This is a case. But at the same time, I wouldn't call that it's going to be something impossible. I wouldn't say never. But yes, it is difficult for him to fight against Erdogan for the second round. But still, if the opposition if the people who are really aware of their future, what they want for their future, if they come together, consolidate, forget about the ideological differences, there might be a chance for Kılıçdaroğlu to be successful against Erdogan. This is a difficult case. Plus, looking at our Ottoman heritage, looking at Turkish history, political history, we know that Turkish people like very strong, very tough guys. Uh, to be in politics. Unfortunately, that's the case. For that reason, comparing Kılıçdaroğlu with Erdogan, Kılıçdaroğlu is a moderate name. Uh, let's say he's ready to listen to different uh, ideas, different political opinions, uh, but he's not that strong as Erdogan as a personal mm. uh, tendency, let's say. And this is the biggest difference. Okay. And the other important well, thing... One second. Let me, just, let me just get in and, and jump to Tarek for a moment, because I want to... He, he was the one who brought in this idea of Erdogan being a hero, which was, was quite pertinent to this situation. He may be a hero to many people, Tarek, but is he worthy of being president? Is he worthy of running the country? When you look at the state of Turkey's economy, we've got soaring runaway inflation, we've got massive unemployment, so much criticism over the dealing of the fallout from the earthquake, which killed more than 50,000 people. Is he the right man to continue leading Turkey? I think it is, it is up to the Turkish people to decide who is the right man to lead the country. We could only offer some intellectual speculations in this particular context, but it seems that the half of the people uh, is very keen on this particular point. Uh, Erdogan is the guy, they think. The other half does not agree with this idea, we know it, but I told you before, since the time he came to power 20 years ago, whatever Erdogan did, uh, benefited Turkey to a significant extent. If you exclude the last five to six years, in particular, when Turkey transformed from parliamentary democracy to a presidential democracy, many things have gone much worse. We all know it. We have already underta uh, 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 undertaken this. We, we know it. Even the Erdogan administration himself is quite aware of, of the problems the Turkish uh, people have been going through these days. They admit it, they accept they have problems, but they also offer some solutions. And we should not forget the fact that they can use all kinds of uh, facilities at the disposal of the state. Uh, and Erdogan has done a good job during the political campaigning season to push the people to believe in the idea that if you give me the chance, I promise that I will, have, I will do my best uh, mm. to, 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 to feel a much better life. And people seem to have bought this uh, uh, slogan, bought this idea. Mm. Uh, so that's why they support it. And we should okay. not also forget the fact that... OK, excuse me, just on that point, this. on the campaign promises, I wanted to, to make a point of raising this. Uh, Yusuf, 
many campaign promises were made by Erdogan. Some would say they are utterly unrealistic given the state of the Turkish economy. He's promising to double the minimum wage. He's promising more energy subsidies. He's promising to increase pensions whilst allowing more than two million people to retire immediately. How is he going to deliver on any of these promises? OK, to tell the truth that Erdogan has applied uh, popular economical uh, declarations against the Turkish voters. It is the reason that if Erdogan does not declare that popular economical declarations, the Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu was offering even the double. For that reason, he was forced to declare such kind of popular economical issues. But let's keep into consideration that 20 years ago, when Erdogan came in power, the minimum wage was $100. Now it is $450. So the Turkish people knows it very well. Although it has not been said and stressed a lot in the Western media, the Turkish people knows that their minimum wage salary has increased four times more when you compare it with the 20 years ago. But I agree that there are economical problems, not only inside Turkey, but in all over the world. But the people address that. Only Mr. Erdogan can solve these problems, but not the Kılıçdaroğlu. This but is many, the issue you said that many, many would say that Mr. Erdogan has created many of these problems, especially when they're looking at inflation. He's created that by not dealing with the interest rates. Yeah, that's true. The, uh, uh, that's true. The inflation is a huge problem when you take a look at to the Turkey. And since the Erdogan is the ruling leader inside Turkey, he is responsible from the inflation. But the inflation rates are not high only in Turkey. It is also at the maximum level high records inside the United States and in many European countries because of the energy prices and the war in between Ukraine and the pandemic created lots of problems. We know that it has also global roots, but of course, no doubt Erdogan is responsible as the leader who is ruling the government. Mm. But it means that the voters say that, OK, we know the problem, we know the reasons, but I do trust you can solve this, but not the Kılıçdaroğlu. OK. OK, well, let's not uh, write Kilish Tarolu out of the conversation just yet before the runoff has even happened. Helene, what are his promises to fix the economy and why didn't they resonate with voters in enough of a way to pull people from Erdogan's party to him? Well, unfortunately, once again, I would say that this is not something very uh, easy because there is a rising, especially among those people who are calling themselves as nationalists. And uh, many of the experts couldn't uh, foresee that the National Movement Party, uh, Bahçeli's party, would, uh, would gain uh, that uh, many votes, especially in central Anatolia. So there is a rising nationalism as a wave, as a political wave in Turkey. And please, uh, let's not forget that Erdogan's whole political uh, propaganda, let's say, in the last year was based on a, a very nationalistic a narrative. Uh, uh, he was talking about great Turkey. He was talking about uh, uh, giving a better place um, in, uh, in the world to Turkey. Uh, uh, for that reason, I think um, we can claim that the people have already bought this nationalistic narrative talking about great Turkish nation and great Turkish state. I think this is something very difficult for Kılıçdaroğlu to to win, to win over uh, in mm. the second round, uh, because uh, many of the people, uh, at least let's say half of Turkey's population, believe that, well, there are problems, whether this is social, economic or political, but these problems are created by the West. And Erdogan can use this anti-Western rhetoric quite well among the Turkish people. Uh, people are not reading books, people are watching TV series, uh, and they are thinking that Turkey is actually great, but unfortunately, unfortunately it's prevented by the Western powers. Uh, the United States have, has been, let's say, the first country which is called by Turkish population in the, in the last decade as number one foreign threat, the enemy. So we are talking about Turkish and United States alliance, but at the same time, we see that Turkish people are believing that the United States is actually not a friend, but an enemy. 
And mm -hmm. unfortunately, let's say in my point of view, this coincides with uh, Erdogan's political propaganda, which underlines the great Turkish nation and uh, country. OK, Tarek, to what extent do you agree with that, that Turkish people are buying into an unrealistic narrative that Erdogan is feeling and they're not seeing the real problems right in front of them? It is, again, an open-ended question and it defies uh, rational or logical thinking of people. We are not in a position to say that the people who vote for Erdogan are irrational. They don't take into account cost-benefit calculations or they don't even... Uh, notice the emerging uh, economic problems in the middle of the country. They are very much aware of those problems and they are quite rational in this sense. But mm. I think they have a, a confidence in the way how Erdogan uh, might rule the country. They had seen in the past that this guy did many positive things for the nation. I think they know it. And they would, but they want to give maybe him one more chance, one last chance to prove his credentials once okay. again. OK, uh, so he might have one last chance yeah. in this runoff. I, I want to jump in there because I want Yusuf to bring in Sinan Unan into the discussion right now because he's going to be a potential kingmaker. He's going to be pretty important over the next couple of weeks with both sides trying to woo him. He won around 5% of the vote. It's a crucial number. Who are his supporters, Yusuf, likely to lend their vote to? Uh, I do not think that Sinan Ogan has a power to carry as a block of what he has uh, already got from the voters. Probably, uh, since he will not be on the list uh, for the presidency, his voters uh, will be uh, using their, uh, their choice uh, in a couple of different ways. I do believe that uh, half of his votes uh, will uh, not be uh, voting in the next coming elections, and the rest of them probably will might uh, choose to go to Mr. Erdogan because when you take a look at to Sinan Oğan, he, his party is an ethnocentric party or alliance, let's say. Mm. For that reason, uh, his voters probably will not choose their address uh, as uh, for uh, Kılıçdaroğlu. OK. Helene, what, what are your thoughts about Sinan Uan and where his voters might fall in two weeks' time? Well, he has already underlined a couple of days ago that he would be uh, asking for a, a, a strong role in the next uh, government, let's say, mm. uh, from the president, who will be, we don't know. But, yeah, he, he would be asking for some important roles in bureaucracy. And uh, it depends on which party will be satisfying his um, demands, let's say. But 5% is, is a success. We can say that uh, Sinan Oğan is there as an important figure. And in my point, he will be affecting the result of the elections because he is getting most of his votes from young people who do not want to decide uh, between Erdogan and Kılıçdaroğlu. They are having an alternative view, and I think both AKP and uh, JHP uh, will be uh, trying to affect the thoughts of these young people who are trying to look for a new alternative in Turkish politics. And for sure, Sinan Oğan will be in Turkish politics in the next decade. Mm, OK. Uh, Tarek, let's not forget the parliamentary elections, which were also held on Sunday, the AK Party and its allies were are on course to win a majority there in the parliament. So even if Kilic Darulu does win the runoff, he's going to be quite stymied, isn't he, in the legislature? Exactly. We, we, we are going to face a, a, a crisis of governmentality if the president is coming from one party and the member of parliaments are coming from other parties, I, I mean, in terms of majority speaking. That's why uh, President Erdogan did very much underline the point that in this two weeks time period, uh, we, if you want to have much more stability in the country, you have to choose me. Otherwise, uh, you will face a, a highly likely a political crisis. And I think the people here in Turkey will buy this particular uh, proposal, the, the, mm. this particular identity. We should also uh, underline something much more important, I, I assume. Uh, Ogan's supporters uh, are very much nationalistic, are very keen on the idea that uh, they should not side with the people who support, quote-unquote, ethnic separatism here in Turkey. So HDP, in close cooperation with the Republican People Party, 
uh, is not a winning ticket on the part of the supporters of Ogan, uh, mm -hmm. Sinan Ogan. So in this particular sense, I, I think Ogan supporters might shift their allegiance to uh, President, uh, President Erdogan in, in this run of elections. And Erdogan will also continue to tell them that, okay, uh, if you if you elect me, uh, I promise that I will do my best to make your life much better because I have the power at my disposal. I can do that. Uh, we should also underline another thing that might positively contribute uh, to the success of Erdogan in the runoff election. The people who support the People Alliance, if I am not mistaken, feel a little bit uh, frustrated and disappointed, and some of them might not show up in the in the upcoming elections. Uh, we should never forget the psychological factors uh, in the upcoming in the upcoming uh, runoff uh, run run okay. election. That's quite important, I think. So. Okay, okay. Uh, Yusuf, just as the last word to you, this second round, this runoff, it's uncharted territory for Turkey. It hasn't seen this in a presidential race before. Helen, Helen uh, alluded to it earlier that it's quite a tense time. What do you feel is the atmosphere in Turkey right now? Uh, I can say that the atmosphere in Turkey uh, is very normal. Yesterday, I was uh, in the streets of the Istanbul, so the people have, uh, in a very uh, normal way, accepted the solution. Uh, no protests on the streets, because everything is so crystal clear. For the second round, I do believe that, since the majority of the parliament is controlled by the Erdogan's alliance, that will not be a huge uh, problem for Erdogan to reach his goals. Uh, the second issue is that already he got 49.5% uh, of the votes. So uh, I do not believe that the participation rates will be, again, 90%. It was almost 90% of the participation rates to do uh, this election. Okay. In the next, uh, in the in the second round, it will be in 80s. So it will bring uh, to Mr. Erdogan two extra points and okay. will carry him to 52 percent. It certainly was an extremely high turnout, as it generally is in Turkey. This discussion is perhaps a microcosm as well of just how polarized the country is at this point. Many thanks to all of you for joining our discussion today. Tarek Oizlu, Helene Sara Atam, and Yusuf Al Baradam. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. For further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.